Perhaps you can indulge our audience a little bit in case anyone is not quite familiar yet with the difference between saturated fat and trans fat. Yeah, so you know, uh, trans fat is a modified fat uh, through the hydrogenation process. So it's a chemical process that eventually renders uh, some of these oils that are very stable, that are shelf stable, that can be used for high heat cooking, for example, and they're very cheap. So that's how they're created. Some of these, you know, hydrogenated soybean oil, cottonseed oil, you know, and the like. And in that sense, they promoted those and they vilified saturated fats. Saturated fats occur in pretty much every natural form. So like every everything that contains fat, uh, whether it's olive oil or grapeseed oil or a steak or seafood or an egg or dairy is going to have some amount of saturated fat. That's all normal. But again, there's varying levels of what would be called saturated, polyunsaturated, monounsaturated fat. The point we need to know really is that our body manufactures saturated fat. That's why animals contain it because their bodies manufacture it as well. And it's very important. It's very anti-inflammatory. It's a tremendous antioxidant uh, as well, and it resists oxidative damage. Welcome to the Charlene Giselle Show. Are you tired of hearing about the next fad diet, wondering what to eat and not to eat, confused about all the conflicting information out there on your blood works? Maybe your doctor has told you about cholesterol and you don't really know what it means. Or perhaps you have had a cardiovascular incident, maybe a stroke, a heart attack, or maybe you are navigating a really high stress period at work and you just want tool to proactively look after your heart health. If this sounds like you, look no further. Today's episode has been made for you. I am deeply honored to welcome America's number one natural heart doctor, Dr. Jack Wolfson. Dr. Jack Wolfson is a board certified cardiologist. For over two decades, more than a million people have experienced the transformational power of his care and strategies. Five-time winners of the Natural Choice Awards as a holistic MD and author of The Paleo Cardiologist, as well as host of The Healthy Heart Show, which I personally really enjoy, his ideas have also been featured in the Wall Street Journal. Dr. Jack Wilson, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. That's a, a, a wonderful intro. I do, uh, I do appreciate it. Excited to be on. Excited to share the truth to your people. I'm so excited to have you on board. I would love to ask you about your shift. You went from being, if I may say so, quite a conventional heart doctor to taking a far more holistic approach to heart health. Do you want to tell us a bit of more about that. Yeah, certainly. Thank you. You know, I was, I'd like to say that I was born into the medical, you know, world. My father was a cardiologist and uh, he was speaking cardiology language when I was in utero. So I'm in my mother's womb and I hear the conversations going on. And then quickly as a child, I would hear all these things and I couldn't, uh, you know, you know, I couldn't wait to become a cardiologist. My, he was, my father was my hero and I wanted to be just like him. And I did just that. I went through the four years of medical training, went through three years of internal medicine, three years of cardiology training. I was the chief fellow in my cardiology training group. And then uh, I would finish up my training and then join the biggest group in the state of Arizona as a hospital based cardiologist doing all the procedures, you know, angiograms and stress tests and uh, a cardiac ultrasound and seeing the sickest of the sick. So my career was was taking off at that time. And unfortunately, my father, he was not doing well. He was getting sick. And eventually he would be diagnosed with a Parkinson's like illness called progressive supranuclear palsy. And he was diagnosed officially at the Mayo Clinic, one of the most prestigious institutions in the world. And at the Mayo Clinic, they tell my father and my, my mom and I that my, you know, my dad, uh, you know, he's got this disease and there is no cure and there is no cause that they know of. So 
he would be dead within three years. And my dad did suffer a cruel death over the next three years. But when they gave him that diagnosis simultaneously and serendipitously, I was introduced to this young woman and she is a doctor of chiropractic. And I'm having a conversation with her and she tells me all the reasons why my father is sick and dying, you know, the way that he eats, the way that he lives, the way that he thinks, all these different things. She tells me all the reasons why he's sick and dying. The Mayo Clinic has none of the reasons. So I listened to what she had to say and then she wrapped it up by saying, you are going to suffer the exact same fate unless you change your lifestyle, your eating, your career. She goes on to tell me that the pharmaceuticals are worthless. The procedures are worthless. They're killing people. So I woke up to the reality. I was, she pulled me out of the medical matrix. I would wind up leaving that big cardiology group a few years later and started my own company, Natural Heart Doctor. Mm. You know, I'm really inspired by your story because I also followed my father's step. And I think it's wonderful to have a father as a role model, but it's also really interesting that you saw that there was a different paradigm to be discovered when it comes to conventional medicine. And I would like for us to maybe discover a little bit more and dive into the fact that recently I had a, a conversation with a surgeon in, in France uh, from my network. And he was telling me about how in med school, you actually don't really get any kind of holistic or nutrition. You really sit for hours and hours about cure and about what drugs to give and prescription and diagnosis and not so much on holistic care and prevention. And the reason it really struck me is because as we speak right now, I am in Asia where I'm running a workshop and here I'm doing Qigong and learning about Tai Chi from masters. And it's all about prevention rather than cure. It's all about what can you do before you get sick? It's what can you learn about your energy and your body before you get to the sickness point? Do we have it upside down? Yeah, I mean, most certainly. And in medical school, you learn about disease. That's what you do. You learn about disease, how, how to diagnose the disease, and then what are the pharmaceuticals or surgical procedures to deal with said disease? There is no conversation about nutrition. No conversation about the healthy lifestyle. No conversation about all the things, of course, that you've become uniquely skilled uh, at. There's none of that going on, which is really just mind-blowing when you think about it, because there's so much that we can do from a preventive, holistic standpoint. Uh, and I think that's what makes the, you know, the surgeon very interesting that you spoke to. And what makes me obviously very knowledgeable about it is that we were, you know, we saw, you know, that side of things. And then, of course, you know, seeing the wrong uh, over there. But, um, you know, listen, I, and I would say this, you know, for what, you know, the story that you shared about your father, you know, with me and how, you know, he had an event and that, you know, changed, you know, your life, you know, from that. I think these are really sentinel moments. And, you know, my father died, but he did not die in vain. You know, his, what happened to him created who I am. And then I can share that message with the world. Hmm. And I know that one of your message and a message that definitely inspired me to have you on the show today was the fact that you do such extraordinary work around demystifying cholesterol. And if I may quote you, I also love the fact that in your book, you say cholesterol is king. <laughs> and I would love to maybe go a little bit into that because cholesterol, let's face it, has such a bad rep. It is perhaps one of the really poorly understood and it is generating a lot of confusion. I have a lot of clients that talk to me about their LDL level and their HDL level and they just get all confused when they read their blood works. Dr. Jack Wolfson, please help us clarify the situation. <laughs> Yes, mo most certainly. And uh, I didn't mean to be sexist when I said cholesterol is king because maybe cholesterol is queen, uh, you know, too, as well. Uh, it's, it's, it's such a powerful, uh, it, maybe you can wear both crowns because it's so powerful. So cholesterol, of course, it makes all of our hormones, 
our cell membranes are loaded with cholesterol. Our big brains up top are loaded with cholesterol. Everyone knows how important vitamin D is. Well, vitamin D is formed from cholesterol as cholesterol courses through the skin and the sun hits it. It turns it into vitamin D. Our digestion is predicated on, on cholesterol inside of our liver excretion into our bile, our gallbladder, and then on to digest our food. Uh, every animal uh, on planet Earth contains cholesterol. Every uh, mammal, you know, certainly uh, in their in their milk uh, of the mother, you know, contains cholesterol. So it is a very vital nutrient. But you also mentioned things like LDLs and HDLs, and those are those are particle carriers. So they carry the cholesterol and other things around the body. If you think about LDL and HDLs and the others as like a bus, well, one of the passengers on the bus is cholesterol and there's other passengers on there, fat soluble vitamins, ADEK, CoQ10, uh, HDLs, LDLs, they are tremendous antioxidants and we live in a world of high oxidative stress. So those are part of the immune system and part of the antioxidant and an anti-inflammatory system as well. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing and those should all be embraced. LDL is a miraculous particle which Again, all mammals make it for that reason, and the HDL is the same. But let me wrap this up and say people should not be asking about what their cholesterol numbers are or even what their lipid numbers are. They should know what their numbers are for inflammation and oxidative stress. That's really all that matters. If you are inflamed, if you have what's called oxidative stress, which is like the rusting of the body, you're in trouble. And you better figure out why, yes. because you are at increased risk of everything. All the lipid stuff, that's all just kind of innocent bystander type of thing. Mm. And am I, am I correct in understanding that actually one of the more helpful way to know whether or not a patient is potentially at risk of a cardiovascular incident is to look at marker inflammation by way of an HSCRP. Is that correct? I totally agree. The high sensitivity or HSCRP is manufactured in the liver, but it is highly correlated with cardiovascular disease. And Modern medicine would say, well, let's come up with pharmaceuticals that'll shut down the inflammatory process. And that will be a failure as well, just like the other failures, the statin drugs, the blood pressure drugs. The answer is always going to be find the cause of the inflammation. When you have the cause, you have the cure. Mm, absolutely. And what's your view? Well, I, I know what is your view because I read your book, but for our listener that may not have read your book yet, what is your view on the whole meat is bad for you? Stay away from meat and don't eat your ribeye. I, I have to, to say, to set the scene that I'm a huge carnivore. I am a primal health coach. I studied under the like of Mark Sisson and I very much believe in the paleo diet. I was brought up on organ meat as a little girl. <laughs> so that's the way I eat. But I'm sure you come across patients that say things like, I don't eat meat for my health. What, what do you think about that? Well, I think it's a mistake. Uh, and I will let me preface this conversation, though, real quick to say no matter what diet you eat, whether it's vegan, vegetarian, paleo, keto, carnivore, make sure it's organic. Get the chemicals mm. out of your food. Get the pesticides out of your food, the artificials, you know, artificial flavors, artificial colors, artificial sweeteners. Make your food organic. And that's a great place to start. And I think what that allows is that if people have sugar addictions, which most people do, I'm, I'm not encouraging you to have ice cream, but if you're going to have ice cream, make sure it's organic and that, again, it's chemical free. So if we start with that, I think that can, I mean, th there's not many people who are going to sit there and say, no, it's better to eat pesticide produce. No, it's better to eat uh, tortured animal products that are not grass fed, uh, grass finished uh, animals. No, it's better to eat farm raised seafood out of a fish tank than it is wild. 
So we're, you're not going to find too many people who would argue uh, on that behalf. The other thing I would say is that, listen, this is common sense stuff when it comes to nutrition. Our ancestors ate a certain way. Every history, every society in the history of the world was a meat and or seafood eater. You can't, you can't reinvent that. Uh, you can't make any better than that. Our ancestors breathed, uh, you know, oxygen and they go to sleep when it's dark out and they wake up when it's light, you know, and it's just, it's just the way that it is. And you can see modern day TV shows, uh, Naked and Afraid, Alone, Survivor. They're hunter gatherers. And if they start off as a vegan, they either start eating meat or they quit the show because they're not going to survive. Uh, because no one's handing them bowls of oatmeal and uh, flax seeds, they're not gonna. They're not gonna survive. So that being said, um, my my nutritional plan is eating nose to tail, ethically raised animals, and the fact that you had, and that of course is is more popular in European you know cultures. The Americans have totally lost uh, all organs from their diet uh, for the last you know seventy five years. And the liver, the heart, the kidney, those are the most nutrient dense things in the entire world. So free range grass fed meats, nose to tail, wild seafood. I think seafood is the healthiest food on the planet. Uh, I am always gluten free in particular. And then the, the um, eating the organic. And then finally, what I do is, is that I do consume sugar, but it is sugar inside of raw honey uh, and fruit. So I do not eat anything that has sugar on the label as like a processed sugar, whether it's coconut sugar, beet sugar, or whatever, you know, uh, you know, that they would do. I only do the raw honey uh, and fruit personally. So that's a complete no, no, you've completely eliminated that, right? So any form of sugar. It's a horrible addiction. And if we can, uh, you know, avoid it to the best of our ability, yet I do want to say that our ancestors, of course, would have had fruit. And yes, it was seasonal. It was not all the time. Um, and they would have had raw honey. And again, it was it was somewhat difficult to come by. But, uh, you know, that being said, I think we live in a world where it's nice to have a treat. Uh, if we if we try and take away everything from people, I don't think we're going to be successful. So, again, if you're going to you don't have to eat the sugar, but if you're going to, you know, keep it with the fruit, keep it with the raw honey that allows you kind of to have your cake and eat it, too. <laughs> but isn't it so interesting, though? I, I've met so many clients that have had a stroke or a heart attack, and I've gone to lunch and dinners with them in a business context and more often than not, they will turn down the meat, but they won't turn down the dessert. Yeah, it's just the this this low fat hypothesis was developed by the American agricultural com you know uh, uh, manufacturers, big ag, the people that plowed down. I'm from the state of Illinois. I grew up in Chicago. The entire state outside of Chicago is plowed under for corn and soy. So, you know, again, they are just selling us uh, this, this agricultural based diet and they love the idea that you'll be eating, you know, oatmeal and that you'll be eating, you know, wheat uh, bread and wheat cereal. These are all super cheap things. They vilified coconut oil, which is just a miraculous uh, food. And they would say, well, don't use coconut oil in your candy, then uh, M&M Mars and Others, the candy manufacturers, of course, they love the fact people were using now hydrogenated soybean oil. So they created all those trans fats, led to millions of people dying, millions of people sick. Uh, and, you know, sometimes uh, you listen, you know, we get very conspiratorial here, but uh, eventually a lot of these conspiracy theories are proven to be true. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you can indulge our audience a little bit in case anyone is not quite familiar yet with the difference between saturated fat and trans fat. Yeah. So, you know, uh, trans fat is an adulterated, uh, it's, it's a modified fat uh, through the hydrogenation process. So it's a chemical process that eventually renders uh, some of these oils that are very stable, that are shelf stable, that can be used for, for high heat cooking for example, and they're very cheap. So that's how they're created. Some of these, you know, hydrogenated soybean oil, cottonseed oil, you know, and the like. Uh, and in that sense, they 
promoted those and they vilify and saturated fats. Saturated fats occur in pretty much every natural form. So like every everything that contains fat, uh, whether it's olive oil or grapeseed oil or a steak or seafood or an egg or dairy is going to have some amount of saturated fat. That's all normal. Uh, but again, there's varying levels of what would be called saturated, polyunsaturated, monounsaturated fat. The point we need to know really is that our body manufactures saturated fats. That's why animals contain it because their bodies manufacture it as well. And it's very important. It's very anti-inflammatory. It's a tremendous antioxidant uh, as well. And it resists oxidative damage. And all those fats, for example, they're in the cell membrane, which is the brains of the cell. It surrounds the cell, keeps things inside the cell and that belong and keeps things outside the cell that don't belong. And that has a large amount of saturated fat in there. And we don't want those fats to be damaged. Uh, and that's a lot of what, you know, what we try and prevent by the ways that we eat. But saturated fat should be embraced as food. It should be embraced inside of our bodies. Uh, and uh, if we can tell people, you know, I think, you know, you mentioned also, you know, carnivore. I think what a lot of the carnivore and a lot of the exclusive meat eaters miss is they miss the seafood part of the story. And that's a major problem because yes. people with the highest levels of omega-3 fatty acids, these polyunsaturated fatty acids, people with the highest levels of those have the lowest risk of everything when they get it from food. So wild salmon, sardines, anchovies, clams, oysters, shrimp, lobster, crab, uh, salmon roe. So the fish eggs, these are just perfect, yes. perfect foods. You're bringing me... In my head, I'm going all the way back to Finland, where I ate the best fish rolls of my life. <laughs> I love eating that type of food, and and my dad fishes as well. Not not particularly well. He's uh, not a very good fisherman, but he's an aspirational fisherman. So I've uh, I've come to learn a lot about fishing over the years. <laughs> well, well, think about this, Charlene. The the salmon, the egg, the roll contains all the nutrients that. A fish needs to come to life. It's all inside of yes. there. What is, what is, you know, what is a chicken egg? It's a cocoon for a baby chicken that contains all the nutrients that a chicken needs to come to life. How do you compare that to oatmeal or wheat bread or kale or shard or, or you know, lettuce? You can't. Now, don't get me wrong. Listen, I'm not, I'm not a carnivore guy. I'm okay with a carnivore cleanse. I think it's okay for a detox. For people that are struggling with a lot of inflammation, that could be a very good way to cleanse out the system. But we are hunter-gatherers, and we did not eat exclusively mm. plants. We did not eat exclusively animals. We did both. But what we did not eat was oatmeal and wheat bread and pasta and cereal that's the stuff we did not or eat. pizza <laughs> or pizza are you really saying that our caveman ancestors did not have pizza dr jack wolfson i'm hugely disappointed now <laughs> let's rewrite history <laughs> yes. yes i think a good a good uh, a good little uh insight that i often give my my clients and it makes them love but i think there is quite a lot of truth behind it is if you're going to a shop and you're looking at a label first of all if it's got ingredients first red flag right because food is not really made out of ingredient it should be food but the second red flag is if you can't pronounce what's written not just because you're french or you're a foreigner or you have a strong accent but you actually can't read it out probably stay away from it <laughs> Yes. No, I, I totally agree. I totally agree with you. Um, you know, you could say, I mean, listen, obviously, you know, keep your processed foods, your big box foods, keep all those things to a minimum. And that's going to be a, a great strategy. So just to summarize, if we were to remove a couple of things from our kitchen and our everyday life, particularly if we want to look after our heart health, have I understood correctly? Number one, the sugar. Number two, anything that would be pro-inflammatory and all those trans fat, is that correct? Yeah, most certainly, most certainly. I think if we, I guess, you know, uh, my pyramid, you know, the, the bottom of my pyramid, if we use that, uh, you know, that, that diagram to think about this, the bottom of the pyramid 
is the nose to tail animal products along with the wild seafood. And then things like avocados, coconuts, olives, those are higher fat sure. foods, again, with very high quality fats, very nutrient dense. Uh, I do eat nuts and seeds. I do recommend vegetables. I do recommend, uh, you know, seasonal fruit, uh, the raw honey. And I think that's a pretty darn satiating diet. Well, I have things, you know, there's some of the grains, you know, whether it's rice or quinoa, I'll have those more so on occasion. Uh, but again, I'm always gluten free. Uh, people ask all the time and they're like, uh, you know, what do I, I'm going to Europe and what do I do? I'm like, yeah, you know, listen, they got the same problems over in Europe, you know, as far as uh, things like leaky gut, things like uh, celiac gluten sensitivity over there. Yes, I believe that there's less spray and less pesticides and glyphosate and things like that, you know, over in Europe. And uh, maybe this you'll find this story funny. You know, years ago, I was at a farmer's market and there was a French baker that was there and they had these beautiful croissants, you know, like the ones that are like stuffed, you know, with chocolate. And um, and I uh. said, uh, I said to the baker, I said, can you make a gluten free croissant? And he said, it's the gluten that makes the croissant. So no. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> it sounds nice. It sounds nice. We've covered a lot of uh, grounds on, on nutrition and demystified a lot of it. I would like us to talk a little bit about activity and specifically, I want to talk a little bit about cardio training because there is a lot that we hear on the media and elsewhere about, you know, zone two cardio, the importance of aerobic training, how many times you should work out every week. I know you're a big advocate of outdoor being you know in nature hiking movement can you tell us a little bit more about cardio training what we need what's the minimum effective dose is there some misinformation out there what what should our average listener be doing right now well the 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 story back in the 1970s and 80s was about Uh, aerobic, uh, you know, activity, you know, running, uh, jogging, uh, getting on the treadmill. Uh, and what we found is that that was pretty bad advice because what it does is that it leads to a lot of inflammation. It leads to a lot of oxidative stress as our body is using fuel as far as food is concerned, along with oxygen to create energy. There's a lot of waste products that are inflammatory and lead to oxidative stress. So you need to balance all that. And most people, of course, have a horrible diet, even when they exercise. So they're generating all these what's called free radicals and this oxidative stress, and they don't combat it with the right foods. And that led to a lot of problems. I think once again, it just goes back to a common sense approach. How did our ancestors live? Did they go on the treadmill for 45 minutes while they were watching TV indoors with all the chemicals and poisons and electromagnetic frequencies from these said devices? Or were they outside in, in nature and were they active? And, and I think that's, you know, the answer is obvious. You know, their activity was carrying children, carrying food, building shelter. You know, there's, you know, I got a rock in my hand and I want to throw it over there because that's where the shelter is going to go. Um, So that was our existence. And I think if we emulate that, the better off we're going to be. And that's where you get into more of that high intensity uh, interval training where you're, you know, running up a mountain, slowly coming down, you know, the mountain. And I think that that uh, interval training, I think, is going to be very good and always trying to be active outdoors, hiking, biking, stand up, paddle boarding, kayaking, swimming. Uh, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, tennis, pickleball. I mean, anything you can do that is active outdoors, I think is going to be uh, a better approach. But the most important thing is, is just trying to get up and be active. Most people are sitting on tech, they're sitting on their computer, they're watching TV. Our ancestors were always outside every single day doing physical activity. And I think that's probably the best plan to follow. The more you do it, uh, the better off it's going to be. Uh, and whether you do, you know, five minutes or 15 minutes or an hour, I think there's going to be benefit uh, for all of it. Now, this sounds completely common sense, particularly if we're looking at our evolution as a species. But let's say we have 
Rob listening to us today and he works on Wall Street. He is in his office 13 hours a day. He's completely bought into everything you're saying, but he's also very practical and listening to us right now and thinking, how do I make this happen? What What's the next best thing that Rob can do if he doesn't, you know, have access to hiking or, or canoeing on a daily basis because he does live in a big city, what, what's the next best thing that he can do? No, that's a very fair question. Um, you know, because back in the day, people would take a smoke break and they would go outside and they would smoke. So can we take a, uh, you know, a sunshine break, a fresh air break, an outdoor break? And if that's for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, I think everybody has to really work to fit that into their days. Uh, and everybody should certainly be allowed to do that. I think we are all so driven and we just want to work, 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 work. Uh, we're going to, you know, work our way into a grave if we don't actually do something about it. Now, what else can Rob do? Uh, one thing you could get into the habit of, you know, right, is the standing desk or every time you're on the phone, can you be standing when you're on the phone? Can you make that a habit, uh, you know, to do so? Because typically you're not on the phone and typing, you know, for example, you know, so can you do that from a standing position? Uh, and I, when I worked in the hospital systems, especially during my training, I would run and, you know, let's just say that, you know, you could walk the stairwells. I would run the stairwells and yeah, it was not outside necessarily, but I would be, I would just go into the stairwell, you know, up and down, up and down, up and down. I used to uh, do marathons and triathlons and stuff like that. And, uh, and that was part of my training uh, while I was actually on call uh, and I was working and I would just, uh, I would do that. So, um, I, you know, and then of course, I mean, there's so many different things, as you know, you could do, but listen, you're a specialist in breath work. You can do breath work at your desk and that'll be phenomenally beneficial. You can just do in your office squats, lunges, uh, you know, leg, you know, based exercises. I mean, there's, it's kind of like, I would say, hashtag no excuses. You can always find something to do that's going to make it, make a difference for you. And how do you remind yourself to do it? How do you get in that habit? Maybe it's just as simple as writing yourself a sticky note or putting an alarm into your phone that says, okay, well, it's noon and normally it's lunchtime. Well, before that, I'm going to do, you know, 10 minutes of some kind of physical activity. Uh, it's, it's more difficult, obviously, because back in the day, everybody did it, right? You know, when you're, you know, living in, in Europe, a thousand years ago, like there was no other choice. You were very active outdoors. That's just the way that it was. And that's how it was for millions of years. The more we time we spend outside, the longer we live. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. And how do you feel about holistic practices such as practicing yoga or practicing Qigong or Tai Chi? Do you believe that from a heart health standpoint, there is value in those practices? This all falls into the category of live well. And we all debate the eat well story. What food should we eat? What should we not eat? But living well is just as important as eating well. And the live well starts mm. with things like sleep and sunshine mm. and physical activity movement. So all these physical activity, movement, uh, engaging in sexual activities, these are all, you know, incredibly important things. And you mentioned whether it's, you know, yoga, qigong, uh, tai chi, breath work. These are all phenomenal. And, and the evidence uh, is there. It's there in the uh, medical literature. It's that, you know, as far as, you know, yoga, for example. You know, and they put people through yoga programs and they see their better blood pressure. They see uh, what happens to lipid and markers of inflammation just from that one particular activity. And, uh, you know, so all these things are all going to be beneficial. And then it's up to the individual. Obviously, we can't do it all. So we decide what works for us, what resonates best with us. Me personally, <clears throat> uh, what works best for me is more of the very active outdoor lifestyle. For someone else who sure. may be more internal, it may be more of, of breath work and yoga, meditation uh, and various modalities. But these are all things, of course, we are not taught anything about in our medical training. I spent 10 years in medical training and we never discussed these things ever. And if you were the person who would try to discuss it, which I was not, but if you were, nobody wants to hear it. Nobody wants to hear it. Nobody wants to discuss it. It's 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 a shame. 
Uh, and that's why Charlene, I would sooner send anyone for health information to you than any cardiologist I've ever worked with in my entire life. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply touched that you say that, but there is also something quite sad about it, I think. <laughs> Yeah. In many respects. And, uh, you know, one, one of the facility that my father attended after his heart attack and his stroke was actually quite extraordinary because it was a facility by the pine forest, by the ocean, where he would be taken on meditative walk where there were uh, holistic coaches and practitioner, where he would be learning about stillness and silence. Now, if you met my father and just imagine the most impatient type A ambitious <laughs> Uh, that, that that would have had to be a huge stretch. And, you know, of course, the apple doesn't fall very far from the tree. And as you can imagine, a few years later, when it was my turn to step into those shoes and to go all the way to India to become a meditation teacher, I found it so, so, so tr triggering. But I'm, I'm seeing hope. And the reason I share this story is that there, there are places out there that, that do know that holistic care plays a huge part in cardiovascular health. So there is hope, right? No, I definitely think there's hope. And I think that the internet has, has created all of that because, you know, back, uh, let, let's say, you know, your father had a heart attack, you know, 40 years ago, where would somebody go for that information? Uh, it, it would have been more difficult, you know, to come by. Now you can get on the internet and find a location for you to recover. Should you have that in, into your mind or be told about that, you can go find locations all over the world that you could fly to tomorrow to help to recover. And I think it is, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. And I think the biggest epiphany does come from the people that are such, you know, if you would say, you know, like type A that are just so, you know, driven and so, you know, career oriented, maybe, or just, you know, again, just so passionate in that one particular area. And then they get that, uh, that sudden change of like, you know, you take this uber successful person and you have them go into a forest and hug a tree and you walk them through that whole process or to walk barefoot, you know, on the beach and to feel it and, and to, and to notice the sounds of everything. I mean, and to become more aware of, of our presence and of our being. It's so powerful and it's so exciting. And uh, yeah, I, 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 it's, it's, it's very empowering uh, for us to have that knowledge. I'm smiling because as you mentioned that, I just had a flashback. Um, a few weeks ago, actually, I was uh, delivering a workshop. And as I <laughs> walked into the hotel, I was still in my non-stage outfit, let's say. And one of the things that I wear are Vibram shoes. So I don't wear any shoes shoes. They're bare fit shoes. And one of my clients to whom I was going to deliver the workshop caught me in those shoes and you're walking around in socks <laughs> and looked very, very confused. And as you can imagine, bringing up grounding and earthing as a benefit to a room full of traders or lawyers can get a few eyebrows to raise. So why don't we uh, indulge on the topic and tell us a little bit about the actual literature and the science behind the benefit of earthing and grounding and getting in contact with the earth? Well, you know, the, the, our ancestors were were barefoot. Uh, all animals in the wild are, are barefoot. Uh, and I think that, again, it just makes common sense that this is how we lived and how we existed. So the more we can do that, mm. the better. How much is there really in the science or in the literature? Again, science has become a very adulterated word over the last few years. Uh, and of course, not everything that we do that is common sense and ancestral has double blind, randomized, placebo controlled trials uh, to it. But it is all about staying connected and this connecting ourselves 
just like the trees are, just like the animals are, humans need to be connected to the ground and different theories about you know, energy and charge and electrons and protons and, and neutrons, you know, in our bodies and how we are energized from the earth and how we are connected and as far as different frequencies that we get uh, that help to structure our cells, the water inside of our cells, all the molecules inside of our cells, all that is, I think, in a lot of ways, uh, theoretical. And I think over time that there will be more data uh, that proves it. But listen, we don't need data that says the sky is blue. We should be breathing air and oxygen. We should be eating these foods. These are all just common sense modalities. And I'll, I'll tell you one thing. I, I travel constantly and it feels very much like living in airport lounges a lot of the time for my work. But I've noticed with absolute certainty that when I land, if I can very quickly upon landing, find a spot where I can take off my shoes and have access to the ground, take a few deep breaths. I like to do two inhale, four exhale, just ground myself, jet lag, sleep, all of that gets optimized. So there, there, there mm. is personal evidence, at least as I can observe, and I've seen it in my clients too. Well, there you mentioned you mean, like the breath work, you know, and the and the breathing modalities. I mean, these all help to engage the parasympathetic nervous system, that branch of the autonomic system, which is all just basic anatomy. And the the sympathetic, as you know, of course, is the go 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 fight or flight freeze, uh, and the parasympathetic is the rest and digest uh, modality. And I think most people, obviously, they are in that go 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 high stress area. Uh, and when you do breath work, you engage the parasympathetic. And you know, one of my favorite techniques is the alternate nostril breathing, you know, which you're obviously yes, familiar with, of course, more so than I am. Uh, and it's funny that, uh, Charlene, every time I show that to people, every time I demonstrate that and I go through the process, I feel it immediately in myself every time that I'm just kind of coming down, you know, from that. And I know that my blood pressure would naturally be dropping and there's a lot of benefits, you know, to that and the nostril breathing and how that increases nitric oxide levels, which of course are vasodilators, open up blood vessels, better blood flow, better blood pressure. Uh, so it's very exciting in that. Uh, another technique that's simple is, is the hum, right? So on the exhale, you know, where you're, mm, and how that engages not only nitric oxide production, but also the vagus, you know, both, you know, vagal nerves that run through uh, our neck uh, and how it engages that. So I think those are all uh, special techniques. And uh, really, and you know what's uh, amazing too, Charlene, is that so many people, they'd say, well, I can't afford to eat free range grass fed meats and I can't afford to eat all that fancy wild seafood in the salmon row. Um, and that could be another argument because we could say to people, you know, um, maybe you can stop having your uh, uh, coffee every morning at your local, you know, shop, you know, with uh, with cream and all the other things you would add to it and save ten dollars there. You can stop getting your hair done, your nails done, uh, you know, buy cheaper clothes, uh, less, you know, more affordable housing, take less trips. I mean, there, there's ways to take care of yourself first. But these other techniques of the live well, these things are free, right? It's, you know, to you know, go to sleep on time. That's free. Being outdoors and physically active. That's free. Doing breath work uh, and, and all this physical. That's all free uh, modalities and they're extremely beneficial. And certainly you look at the expenses that one accumulates uh, when they're sick, that these preventive strategies will undoubtedly save you extraordinary amounts of money uh if that's important uh you know at the end of the day and you know one one of those free techniques that you're mentioning that i feel very grateful because i've learned from you uh from following your content is uh thyroid sun exposure i've seen you do it i've learned it from you and uh, just the other day as i was getting myself into sun bathing and getting a little bit of light exposure, I made sure that I orientated so that my thyroid would be exposed and thought about you. So thank you for that, doctor. No, for, I mean, you know, our skin is a solar panel. It's built to collect light. It has that purpose. So the more that our solar panel is out in the sun, 
And the power of the sun not only is energizing the skin and the solar panel and creating vitamin D and nitric oxide, ultimately it creates melatonin. So melatonin, when we are exposed to the natural light during the day, all the processes are in place to create melatonin. And then when we go to sleep, melatonin levels spike. And melatonin is the recovery hormone. It is the master hormone that controls everything else, every thyroid, sex hormones, uh, uh, dopamine, oxytocin, all these things, they're all predicated on, on melatonin production. That is just that master clock. And if you don't go to sleep on time, if you're surrounded by tech, uh, if you do these unhealthy behaviors, you're, you're in trouble. So you got to get, you know, again, that sunshine, as you said, you get outside in the light, you get grounded. That's some of the benefit of what you're saying, right? Because if all you do is wind up going from an airport into a taxi, into a hotel, into a restaurant, and your existence is inside, uh, you are, you're going to be in trouble. And what you do, and so many others do with what I say is time travel. You know, in the history of our existence, our ancestors never left 15, 20 mile radius of where they were born. And here we think we can be in Singapore one day and be in Paris the next day and then be in Los Angeles two days later. What do you think that means to the human body? What does that mean for airline pilots, people who travel? It's not good. It's not good. And I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying, hey, you got to be you know, forewarned about what the potential consequences are. And because you do that, you better be doing all the other things right. Is there any practical steps that someone listening to us right now who is a business exec mm -hmm. and flying across the world as part of their job, really aware of everything you're saying, but also wants to pursue their career? Is there something they can do practically to counteract a little bit of, of this negative impact? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there, there definitely are strategies to try and combat the jet lag uh, that somebody would get to try and get on the local, you know, time zone. And, and, and again, those things have been documented. And I don't know if there's any, any right or wrong or any proven uh, things in those areas of how you can quickly uh, get onto a local time zone, or even if that's possible for people that travel, you know, for a living, it's because, because if they're traveling constantly, you know, that makes it very difficult. I think in that scenario, you just have to do everything else the right way. So when you're traveling, for example, I travel and I bring my own food. I don't eat airport food, um, you know, and, and really traveling sometimes is a really good time to fast. But if you are going to be that person yes. who's going to eat, you know, I'm the guy who opens up a can of sardines on the airplane. And nobody likes that guy. Oh, you I'm must be guy. the popular guy then. <laughs> You're that uh, guy. <laughs> the sardines, the hard-boiled <laughs> eggs. And you know what's funny, Charlene, is that I travel often with my wife and our four children. So we bring, because uh, they're not going to fast. I mean, they're going to want to eat something. So we bring uh, freeze-dried liver, for example. We'll bring uh, sardines and we'll bring avocado. And the people who notice us, it's very exciting uh, the, the stewardesses, you know, and the stewards, the flight attendants who notice what we're doing. It's a great way to teach and to educate people. But that's the way that we do it. That's the way we travel. Uh, you know, so ultimately, like I said, you know, just trying to do all the other things uh, appropriately is going to be your best strategy to survive when you live that lifestyle. But um, we'll make no, you know, you know, you know, not try and hide the fact that it's just, it's not a healthy lifestyle choice. But again, yeah, how do you come up with strategies, you know, to, to stay healthy, you know, while you're, while you're traveling? Uh, I think, um, I, I think it's obviously very important. Very important indeed. There is just one more topic I would like to, to explore with you before we, we wrap this, things up is the correlation in, in the patient that you see and the work that you do between state of chronic stress or burnout and cardiovascular incidents. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, uh, again, we get into this eat well, go live well, and then there's the think well. And the think well is just as important, if not more so, than the eat well and the live well. So we need to have good thoughts. We need to be happy people. Happy people have less heart attacks than unhappy people. So make yourself a happy person. 
Find your spirituality. Find your passion and your purpose and have gratitude. Uh, have your sense of community. You know, get, get in the tribe that you want to be in. If there are unhealthy people in your tribe, unhealthy people for you, then you need to either improve those relationships or remove those relationships. Uh, every time that I talk to someone who's had a heart attack, there's always stress that preceded it. The number one cause of heart attacks in young women, aside from uh, from uh, some kind of uh, you know uh, illicit drug use, the number one cause of heart attacks in women is what's called SCAD, or spontaneous coronary artery dissection, often stress induced. Women who are 40 to 60. Uh, they often suffer from what's called Takasubo cardiomyopathy or what is the broken heart syndrome. They are a very highly successful woman and they go in to have a meeting with their boss and the, beat, and the meeting does not go well and they walk out of the room and they suffer from a heart attack and it's not from a blockage, it's from something that suddenly happens, typically a spasm or shutdown in the artery that therefore leads to a large heart attack. We go in there with catheters, we don't see any blockages, but it was a stress-induced event called Takasubo cardiomyopathy, Takasubo uh, after the Japanese word for octopus, um, because that's the way the heart looks uh, uh, when we study it. Uh, in any case, I don't, we don't have to get too far into that, but that's broken heart syndrome. So stress is a massive, massive factor. And it's important to elucidate that from their history because then you can teach them techniques going forward. Hey, you want to make sure that you eat well, live well, and think well moving forward because you can suffer from another heart attack. So these are all preventive strategies, you know, and how we do that. And then how do we, you know, again, how do we get that sense of passion and purpose and gratitude? Um, I think it comes from a lot of the work that you're, that you do uh, personally, professionally, you know, Charlene, uh, and, and all these things really work in well together. And when we eat well, we tend to think better. When we live well, we think better. When we think better, we tend to eat and live better. So they all work beautifully together. They're not silos. They're not separate. It's all part and parcel of the same uh, process. Uh, so again, find your happy uh, find your happy place and, and understand also that the strategies we're talking about, they work. This is the hundred year heart. This is how things work. I do want to, before, you know, we, we check out though, I do want to, you know, circle back to uh, something inside of live well, which is about having a healthy environment that you live in. And we can talk about things like heavy metals or asbestos or, uh, 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 paints and flooring and other environmental toxins. But I do want to shed the light to people about living in a home that has suffered water damage and therefore you're being exposed to mold and bacteria that are growing in a water damaged environment and how those release their toxins that ensure their survival. These are living and breathing organisms that want to survive. So they release their army, otherwise known as toxins. And their army does the work for them by killing off other molds and other bacteria, insects, and potentially humans. So I have articles that I've wrote about 14 different mechanisms of mycotoxin, cardiovascular toxicity. So make sure that your environment is safe from these environmental toxins, including asbestos and metals and VOCs and electromagnetic fields and just in thousands and thousands of other chemicals, laundry detergent, fabric softener, dryer sheets, colognes, perfumes, uh, cleaning supplies, all those things. But make sure that your home does not have water damage. Test, don't guess. There are tests that you can do yourself and your home to make sure you and your family are not at risk. I'm so glad you brought that up. Mold is a real issue. I've had clients looking for years at different ways to get better, quick fixes, if I may say so. Uh, and the elephant was in the room, literally, was hanging on the wall, you know, and we didn't know. Uh, and, and is it 
also important to mention that it's not always visible. Like it's not always obvious, right? That there will be that mold. I mean, there's very, you know, very sinister places where it hangs out, but uh, mold and the understanding of, of living in a water damaged structure and how dangerous that is, it really helps to have us understand uh, why there's so much sickness going around because the whole world lives in mold. The Hebrew Bible, the book of, Le of Leviticus, talks about mold in multiple chapters and what to do about it. So again, they're writing about this 4,000 years ago. They knew about it then. We should know about it now. Uh, and uh, it's, it's again, it helps to explain everything where you get a lot of people, oh, I eat healthy and I exercise and I get my sleep. And why did this happen? Why am I still sick? If you're living in water damage, and being exposed uh, not only to the you know to the mold and the mycotoxins and the bacterial toxins, but also the chemicals released from the water damage. It's it's just this horrible, horrific indoor air quality that ultimately leads to so much uh, uh, death and destruction. And do air purifiers help? Yes. Do detox mechanisms help? Yes. Does eating better help? Yes. Sleeping better. All these things that we do help, uh, but they're not the answer. The answer is to get out of the unhealthy environment. I'm so glad you've brought it up. Thank you so much for all your wisdom and insights. I would love to ask you where can our listener find out more about the amazing the work that you do. And your wife, Heather, is a doctor too, a chiropractor. And uh, can you tell us a little bit more about where our audience can connect with your beautiful work? Yeah, no, thank you so much. My website is called naturalheartdoctor.com. Uh, we see uh, uh, people in person and we see people virtually. I've been doing virtual uh, consultations since 2012. Uh, so they can get information about that. And I haven't, you know, there, you know we work with uh, other cardiologists. We work with uh, nurse, uh, uh, you know, nurse practitioners. We work with naturopathic medical doctors. We've got a team of health coaches. So we've got a pretty well-rounded group that helps people. Um, but, uh, you know, listen, it's all, it's all part of a collaborative effort. You know, of course, you know, listen, you're doing some phenomenal work and you, you know, you're, just, you're helping so many people with your education. You know that. And, and I want to just certainly pat you on the back and say, you know, I appreciate you and knowing you and all the stuff that you're doing. Because if we live with nature, we use common sense modalities. We use the most advanced testing in the world some evidence-based supplements, biohacking strategies, and the biohacking strategies could be light therapy and could be ozone and could be IVs and could be all these other things that people do. Um, but that's the order. <laughs> Eat well, live well, think well, test, don't guess, evidence-based supplements, biohacking strategies, you know, and uh, I think a lot of what you do, uh, Charlene, and, and, you know, because I know people obviously who do sim, I think it is. It's like, you know, you're you're in that live well. I mean, of course, you talk about foods, but you're in that live well component regarding these physical activities and movements and breath work. But then also you get into the biohacking uh, nature of these various things, you know, as well. And your you know, hypnotic work, of course, would fall under think well. But again, these also are just these. Uh, these these strategies that maybe are not necessarily ancestral, although I do understand breath work, you know, goes back, of course, for, for millennia. Um, but uh, these are all wonderful, beautiful techniques and they work. So thank you. I'm so glad you've brought biohacking up. I wouldn't have thought about bringing it up with you. And one thing that I hear a lot of people get concerned, particularly around heart health, when they hear about ice plunges, for example, or sauna, is often, oh, check with your cardiologist first. Or if you have had a heart attack or a stroke, sauna is not advised, or ice plunge. Mm -hmm. Any any information here? Is that true? Well, I, I mean, first of all, whatever you do, you start off slow, right? So physical activity, sauna, um, uh, you know, ice baths, everything has to be slow and gradual. That's for sure. My personal opinion, um, and not, not my personal about sauna, sauna works. People, you know, you spend time in Finland, the data that comes out of Finland, 70%, you know, uh, reduction in death over a 20% period in people who frequently sauna versus those who, who never or seldom sauna. So sauna undoubtedly is a tremendous biohacking strategy. 
Uh, and the data really comes from the old fashioned sweat boxes. Like, you know, we could talk about infrared yes. and different forms of light. And I think that there's, there's benefit, but it's the sweat that is undoubtedly the proven benefit. The other stuff will be theoretical. Um, the, un, the, the undoubted, you know, thing is, is the sweat box. That is good to know. That is good to know. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Jack Wolfson. We've learned a lot. I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and considering I've now heard it directly from you and I just received the confirmation that gratitude is good for the heart. I'm going to share my deepest gratitude <laughs> to you for everything that we've learned with the knowledge that it's good for our heart. So gratitude all the way. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, I'm grateful for you. Thank you. Now that you've learned about the extraordinary power of breathwork to optimize your personal well-being and boost your professional performance, I have a gift for you. Download your breathwork ebook by following the show notes so that you can start your personal breathing journey guided by me.